Internet Communications at the e-book e e e company uh, and he has very much uh, dived into how communities of software developers work and how they can uh, be built. He's been at the ADA Initiative Advisory Board which is an initiative to support women in uh, open technology and culture. And uh, now, recently, he has been elected as a president of the Library and Information Technology Association. Yes, now that's, uh, that's your turn. Thank you. All right. So, the title of the talk today is Link to Open Community. Um, there's a bibliography and a PDF of my slides available at andromedayelton.com slash talks slash swib16, which I just tweeted out on the conference hashtag, so if you just want to click on it, instead of typing in my extremely long name, you can do that thing uh, and follow along. So, um, I was asked here to talk about inclusion in tech communities. Um, and I, I asked in my abstract, they say build it and they will come, but what happens if you build it and they don't? Anyone who's ever tried to get contributors involved and, and sticking around over the long haul with your uh, open source project knows that it's not necessarily easy to do. And so I'm going to talk over the course of this talk about ideas and strategies that people have come across in trying to uh, include more and more diverse people in their conferences, their open source projects, et cetera, and hopefully you will come away with some ideas that are of use to you. So the sort of overarching theme that I'm unifying things with is the idea of inclusion as interfaces. Anytime you have a project or a conference and a person, there's, there's a boundary between the person and the project, and that boundary may be more or less um, easy to navigate, <laughs> more or less turbulent, um, as, as here you, when you have the water crashing against the rocks, and uh, sometimes you end up with some chaos at that border. Um, interfaces have also been really relevant to me this week because here I am in a country I have been to only once, 25 years ago. Um, so there are a lot of unfamiliar interfaces for me now, starting with the fact that uh, my German basically extends to please, thank you, and the girl is hungry, um, which are useful for me, but don't actually get me very far. <laughs> um, and so I, I've been thinking about you know, what aspects of, of being here make it easier or harder for me to navigate. Um, the, the fact that essentially everyone has dramatically better English than my German is very helpful, even if it makes me feel guilty. Um, the, the fact that every public transit system in the world has its own completely unique ticketing interface that makes no sense. Uh, it, it literally took me half an hour to figure out how to buy a train ticket yesterday, and it kept telling me that I was wrong, but it was telling me in German, so I didn't know how to fix it. Um, anyway, so, so the question of what makes it easier or harder to navigate a space that's totally unfamiliar to you is, is very much on my mind this week. I'm going to talk about three basic categories of interfaces that a person can have with, with, a, with a culture or a project. And the boundaries between them, honestly, are not really uh, clear boundaries. I, I could have chosen to put things in various categories. But the basic types of interfaces I'm going to talk about are infrastructure, governance, and culture. Where infrastructure is basically uh, what, what things do you have that contributors need to work with as they uh, set up your project or contribute to your project. Um, governance is what sort of rules do you have for how people behave in the space, what the leadership can and can't do. And culture is culture. So let's talk about that. Let's start with infrastructure, the, the stuff you have that people contribute to or that they use in order to contribute. Um, examples of infrastructure you can have that make it easier to include people. Um, Above all, you need tools to support decision making. And that might be for leaders of a project, or that might be 
for contributors to a project. So in terms of leaders, uh, Mozilla has done a lot of research on contributor retention, and they're in a great place to do that since they have this enormous world-spanning project with you know tens of thousands of potential contributors, and they get to employ statisticians and stuff. And what Mozilla has found is the single most important factor in whether someone comes back and contributes to Mozilla long term is does someone respond to them within 48 hours? Um, if they submit a pull request and they get some kind of response inside of 48 hours, they will probably come back and contribute again. Even if that response is just, I saw your pull request, I'm really busy, I can't review it for a few weeks and I'll get back to you, that's good enough. They, they literally just need to know that someone is paying attention and someone cares. Um, and then if, if you can get to them at some point within days two through seven with a suggestion as to here's what to do next, um, that also increases the chance they'll stick around. If they don't hear from anyone within a week, they will never come back. And you have just lost this contributor forever. Um, so leaders need tools that help them make decisions like that. They need an easy way to keep track of, of what's in the queue, what has come in recently, what's our response time? Can we monitor how quickly we get back to people? Um, so they can, they can keep track of that. Uh, contributors also need tools to support decision making. Uh, Mozilla has also found the vast overwhelming majority of people who are going to contribute to their code base do so within 24 hours of making an account. Uh, there's a really long tail. There are people who make an account and don't contribute for a year. But overwhelmingly, people who contribute anything are going to do it within that day. So you need a way to capture their enthusiasm and make it really easy for them to make a decision about what to do. Um, one example that a lot of projects, uh, including the Django Python-based uh, web uh, framework has is an easy pickings tag. So if your issues queue has some tag along the lines of easy pickings, um, that tells contributors who may be new to the project that this one is, is relatively simple to get into. You know, as, as you know, some places are really hard to contribute to a project. You have to be an expert in things. They're not good for newcomers. Um, but, but some are pretty straightforward. They may even be things like, you know, clean up the documentation that don't even require knowledge of code, that just require someone who speaks the language reasonably well to, to go through and make sure a section makes sense. Um, so tags and other metadata that make it easy for contributors to tell, like, do I have the skills to make this contribution? Where can I go to find something that's, that's doable and interesting is really helpful. So make it easy for your potential contributors to tell where they can be a part of things and make it easy for your leaders to tell if you're actually being successful <laughs> at doing that. Other infrastructure that I almost listed as most important because it is dear to my heart um, is documentation. Uh, documentation is a form of hospitality. Explaining to people um, what, how do you install the code or how do you use it as an end user or what are the guidelines for contributors or any of the other things that people might need to know. Explaining that clearly is a way of being hospitable to people and showing respect for them and making it easy for them to do stuff. Um, even, even if you have tagged your, your project with different ways people can contribute, if they don't have an explanation of how the tool works or what style they're expected to submit code in or any of that, um, it's, it's unnecessarily challenging for them and they spend a lot of work on things that are not being a part of your project or your community and they get frustrated. Um, there's a really great um, series of blog posts written by Jacob Kaplan Moss on documentation and again all of this stuff is in uh, andromedayelton.com slash talks slash swib16 that I tweeted on the conference hashtag so you can, you can go follow up the specifics if you like. Uh, but he's got this great series of blog posts on how you write good documentation. And he was one of the founders of the Django project, which has amazing, amazing documentation. Um, I'm actually primarily a Django programmer, and I learned that because 
somebody needed to be at a previous employer and everyone else was busy. Um, and I was able to learn to be a Django programmer because their documentation is amazing. There's an incredible tutorial and, and everything you might need to know is really clearly explained somewhere on the website. And so that made it possible for me to get up to speed. Um, anyway, so Jacob Kaplan Moss says, there's basically three different types of documentation your project needs to have. Um, it needs to have a quick start. So some sort of tutorial where people can experience success over their lunch break. Obviously, you're not going to teach them everything they need to know, but you want them to be able to get your project up and running and do something interesting inside of half an hour. Because that's going to give them that sort of thrill of victory and convince them that, that this is a useful bit of, of software to work with and this way lies hope. <laughs> um, so that's your quick start. You need a concept guide that explains sort of in depth what are the different things, ideas, uh, components in this project. Why are they there? Why did we make the kinds of decisions that we made? Um, something that helps people understand the why. And then you need an API reference. You need the thing where obsessive people can go look up, like what are all of the arguments that this function takes and what does it return? Because sometimes people just need to know that stuff. Um, but one of the critical things is these are all different pieces of documentation and they have different audiences. The person who needs the API reference is the expert programmer, you know, the developer who's planning to contribute, uh, the person who is making a, a custom local installation of your, your project and who has a lot of tech skills. Uh, the person who needs the quick start is someone who may or may not have significant uh, programming skills. There's someone who's new to your project. They're spending a short amount of time on it, deciding if they want to spend more. These are different people with different skills and different goals. And so you need to have different documentation for all of them. Um, Jacob Kaplan Moss also has some great pointers on style, like how do you develop a good voice for writing your documentation, uh, which is not easy. Uh, so I recommend checking all that out because it's great. Um, and there's also actually a conference called Write the Docs if you find yourself really liking documentation. Um, I think it's in Portland, Oregon in the US every year. And this actually grew out of the Django project because Django's documentation was in fact so good that it spawned a conference about documentation. Uh, so if that's your thing, there's a whole community of people there who love it as much as you do. Okay, other things infrastructurally that people have done to help get people involved uh, is the Wikipedia Tea House. Uh, this is a project that grew out of Wikipedia's gender gap efforts. Uh, as you may know, um, Wikipedia is fairly overwhelmingly slanted uh, toward male contributors. And Wikipedia has also had a number of problems over the last decade with uh, retaining editors for a number of reasons. And so they've tried some things to sort of broaden participation, reach out to more people, and maybe have them stick around longer. And the Tea House is one of those efforts. And it's a, a site on the English Wikipedia where basically new people can go and ask questions and get help. And it's, it's kind of this weird mind-bending wonderland, actually. Um, because if you've ever spent much time on English Wikipedia, you've probably run into places where people are having these just like really unpleasant discussions and being super mean to each other. Um, and then you go to the tea house and someone asks a question and someone is like, thank you for asking that question. Let me patiently explain to you the answer to it. I hope this worked for you. Please ask again if you have more questions. You're like, well, what just happened? Why is everyone nice? Um, <laughs> so the tea house is great. Um, and uh, clearly it's helpful for beginners in that they can go and ask those questions that maybe they would feel stupid asking. And, and not merely get an answer, but feel a sense of trust that people are not going to be mean to them for not already knowing the answer. Um, Wikipedia Tea House is also great in that it's, it's on the wiki, right? So it uses the same interface as the wiki, and it has some of the same cultural norms as Wikipedia in the sense that all the content is open, and there's uh, publicly available history. So it's, 
it's culturally part of Wikipedia and it's technologically part of Wikipedia, but it provides a much gentler on-ramp into the whole experience. Um, so people can sort of get accustomed to, to those norms that may be unfamiliar with them. You know, working that openly may be really new to some people. They can get used to that, but they can get used to that in a way where there are hosts who are specifically tasked with being nice and helpful. Um, they can get uh, answers to questions that they may need to have answered before they can do anything else on Wikipedia. Um, and then the tagline for Wikipedia, or the Tea House, actually says, you know, welcome to the Tea House, a friendly place for, you know, whatever, asking questions. Um, so it's, it's branded really consciously around being welcoming. Um, and, and Wikimedia has done some research on uh, the Tea House's impact on editor retention, and it seems to be useful. Um, again, I have links to all that research uh, on my website, so you can check that out. Um, and then another open source project that has done a couple of things that I really like in terms of providing infrastructure to make it easy and welcoming for people uh, is, is Dreamwidth. Um, I don't know if, if this is familiar to many of you. Were any of you on LiveJournal back in the day? Because I was. <laughs> All right, awesome. So basically this is unfamiliar to the entire rest of you, but LiveJournal was, was a journaling uh, thing that if you were possibly like an emo teenager circa 2000, you may have been on. Um, and then like politics happened as they do and Dreamwidth uh, split off from LiveJournal. Uh, LJ had an open source code base, so Dreamwidth forked that and created a new like journaling community with um, sort of aimed at a different portion of the site, a different population of users and with a slightly different set of features. Um, and they made two big decisions in splitting off from LiveJournal that affected their culture going forward. And they're still around. I mean, this, this um, came out of stuff that happened, you know, 15 years ago, but it's still <laughs> totally in existence. Um, so one of the big strategies that they made is to speak openly with their users. Um, they clearly were very influenced by the whole clue train manifesto market speak in human voices idea. And they were also very influenced by the fact that, that LiveJournal at the time when there was something like a site outage just kind of didn't tell anyone what was happening until after they'd fixed it. By which point, of course, all of their user base had started like swearing and setting things on fire because things didn't work and they didn't know why and they were really frustrated. Um, <clears throat> so Dreamwind made a decision from day one to be open with their users and to say like what's going on, even if all they could say is, we know there's a status outage, we, we're working on it, we don't know why, we'll, we'll update you. Um, and the result of this is uh, roughly, uh, paraphrasing from um, one of their internal logs that they made public, they found, I think this is the only website in the universe where when things break, people actually apologize to us for reporting it. <laughs> their, their users trust them so much that their users are like, I'm so sorry, but um, if it's not too much trouble, can, can you please fix this thing that isn't working? I feel really bad about, you know, making your day harder. I love you. Um, <laughs> Yeah, I mean, this is probably not how you're used to website users behaving, but it turns out that, that when you respect people's feelings and you respect their desire to understand and be involved and you communicate with them in a way that's, you know, human and respectful, they, they respond by caring about you. So that was great. <laughs> Um, and then the other big decision that Dreamwith made was to actually slow down their... Um, the deployment of their open beta in order to spend some time building the community rather than the code base. So they, they could have gone into open beta at least a couple of weeks earlier than they did if they had just sat down and put their heads down in the code for a few weeks. But instead, they, they decided to have more people working on the code. Um, instead of having like the two core people just buckle down and finish it. They, they made sure to have a much bigger group of people working on those issues, which took longer, but it meant that they had 
a core group of contributors from the very beginning who were invested in the project, and that gave them the chance to, to be sustainable in the long term. Right, you can't rely long term on one or two main contributors making your project work forever because eventually like life will happen or they'll get burned out or they'll get interested in other things. You need to have enough people involved that you can have new leadership step up over time, that they can do outreach to new members. So they slowed down their deployment to let more people work on it. Um, and they also spent that time on things like documentation, as mentioned. Um, and coming up with this thing called DreamHack, which basically was an easy installation. It, it was a hosted installation. So if people wanted to contribute, well, if you want to contribute to an open source project, what's the first thing you have to do? You have to get it up and running on your machine. Uh, that may be easy, or that may be really hard. Uh, in the case of DreamWidth, at the time, it was really hard. Um, and it actually relied on some outdated versions of dependencies, so people were having to like break their systems to make things work, and that made them sad, and people would give up. And, and if they give up on the installation process, there's no chance that they can do anything more sophisticated. So they actually built a hosted uh, installation where if you wanted to play with it, you had this sandbox you could just go get. And that made a tremendous difference to their ability to onboard new contributors because it removed this obvious source of frustration. Um, there's a great uh, Code for Lib Journal article by some people at uh, North Carolina State University that says basically you should time things like this, right? Like if you're a developer at a fancy library that has a whole team of developers, there's a lot of things that are easy for you that may not be easy for the people that you want to have using your code or developing your code. And things that are easy for you may not be easy for someone who's the only developer at their library or someone who is not a developer who maybe has some great command line skills and has some, some ability to install software but doesn't know how the code works. Um, so in the NCSU article, uh, what they did basically was they went out and they found the target users of their software. And they asked them to perform various tasks like um, get this up to a working installation on a laptop or pilot a deployment. And they, they had a stopwatch. They saw like how long does it take? Um, you know, days, hours, minutes. Um, the lower those numbers are, the more people are going to end up being involved, again, because the annoying upfront hurdle is minimized, so they're actually able to spend their time on using your project, contributing to your project, fun stuff other than installing dependencies, which literally everybody hates. Um, so they invested some extra time up front in, in these things, and it paid off long term in terms of sustainability and community building. So what this means really is that the most important project infrastructure, it's not actually any code that you have in a project you write, it's everything else. <laughs> the infrastructure that makes it easy for people to be part of your project and part of your community is the documentation, it's the tutorials, it's the fact that your install process is easy and well documented and hopefully relies on standard tools. If you're working in Python, make it possible to use pip to install your project. You know, look, look at homebrew. Uh, whatever the, the standard sort of installation path is for the language your project is in, like, let people install it using that thing. Um, you know, th think about what are the actual tech skills that it takes for people to contribute. Does that match with the tech skills you want people involved in your project to have? Um, you know, if, if, if you say you're building a tool that non-developers can use, sit some non-developers down and see if they can actually use it. Because <laughs> if you are a developer, you can't tell, I promise. I'm a developer and I, I can't. Um, contributor guidelines. You know, if people want to show up and write code or write documentation or run a workshop or something like that, have you written down anything they need to know before they can do that, you know? Is there a style guide? Is there a contributor license agreement, which I'll, I'll mention more later? Um, do you follow just basic software best practices, right? If, do you have a test suite? So that if people write code, they can tell if it broke your stuff. Um, 
Have you actually written down what all the dependencies are and what versions they all are? Because I have tried to install a project that wrote down its dependencies and none of their versions, and it was really, really annoying. <laughs> um, everything other than the code is the stuff that makes your project easy for people to approach. All right. Governance. That's all stuff that's mostly about contributing um, in terms of code. But governance is more about we're all people and we interact as people and we, we come together in physical spaces and virtual spaces and what kind of rules might we need to make those interactions work out? Um, what can our leadership do and not do as well as what our members do and not do? So I mentioned contributor license agreements. Uh, project Hydra, which is an open source repository project, uh, goes very strongly into contributor license agreements and they have a section on their wiki that explains why they do that. Um, and Bess Sadler, who's one of the leaders of that project, uh, gave a great Code for Lib talk in, I think, 2013 about building a commons, creating a commons. And one of the things she said is that um, your project needs to be understandable to the lawyers in some sense. Um, it's kind of annoying, but having, having a contributor license agreement where contributors have clearly um, given you a license to that code uh, puts your project in a much better legal situation in case anyone challenges it later on. And also some people's institutions may, may require that your project have some sort of clear license um, in order for them to let their people work on it. Um, you know, institutions have lawyers and they care about these things whether or not you do. Um, so it may be important to have a contributor license agreement. On the other hand, uh, the Software Freedom Conservancy, which uh, supports lots of open uh, source projects, says really uh, you don't, in most cases, need a contributor license agreement because it serves primarily to, to annoy people, sort of like an extra hurdle that gets in people's way. Um, so th there's pros and cons, but it is worth thinking about whether you need you certainly should have a license for your project, but then whether you go on to have your, your contributors sign a license or not may or may not be the best thing for you, but you should think about it and make that decision consciously. Um, moving on to more sort of in-person things. Incentives to bring a friend. If you want people to come to your, your workshop, your conference, whatever, um, especially if you want new people to come, one great thing you can do is, is give people discounts or other incentives if they bring a friend with them. Um, this is something that the Boston Python workshop did. They, they taught uh, beginner-friendly workshops to women and their friends. So the idea there was they wanted to increase uh, gender diversity in the Python community, and so they had workshops that were primarily aimed as women, uh, but people who are not women could come if, if they had a friend who was a woman that they came with. Um, <laughs> so it's, it makes it, um, it, it achieves their goal of gender diversity while also you know, sort of being more, more friendly. Um, Software Carpentry, similarly, will, uh, for some of its workshops, give people discounts if they come with friends. Um, not necessarily with any, any gender restrictions, but uh, discounts if they come with friends. And the idea behind that is that entering a new sort of community or learning a new tech skill can be really intimidating. And if you show up with a friend, you will not feel as intimidated, because when you feel intimidated, your friend will make you feel better. Um, the idea is also that um, you, you'll just have better feelings associated with the experience. You know, if you go to a workshop on a new skill and your friend is there, you have now had an experience with your friend and you have all these positive friend feelings associated with it. And that will make you more engaged with whatever you just learned long term. So this is, this is a, a strategy for attracting like new people and particularly people um, who may not yet have the skills to fully engage with your project. Um, if you want to bring in experts from maybe populations that haven't been well represented in your project before, uh, the sort of best practice there is do a lot of outreach and then do blind review if you're asking people to submit you know, conference proposals, journal proposals, things like that. Um, there was a great article, uh, How I Got 50% Women at My Gaming Conference. If you're at all familiar with, like, gaming, 
You know that you do not get 50% women speakers at your gaming conference. This never happens. Um, but this one conference organizer did, and, and the way she did it is she went out to basically like all the women she could think of, and this is time consuming, right? Try not to be the only person doing it. It is really, really time consuming to do this outreach stage. Um, but she went out to all of them and she's like, hey, I'm running this conference on games and I know that you know, you're know you doing some interesting work and I, I really hope you'll consider submitting a proposal. And they were like, oh no, I don't, I don't actually know anything about anything. Uh, this will basically always happen if you ask women to submit conference proposals. They'll be like, oh no, I don't know anything about anything. And then she'd be like, what about that one thing that you did? And she'd give them like an example of work that they were doing and they're like, oh, yeah. <laughs> I guess I do know stuff about that. This is funny, actually, because Christina asked me, like, hey, you want to come and talk about inclusion? I'm like, oh, I don't know anything about that. Like, all these other people are doing way more work on it than I do. I don't know anything about that. And then 30 seconds later, I'm like, wait, I just thought of, like, eight projects off the top of my head that I know that people are doing that are really cool. Never mind. Okay, I'll come and talk to your conference. Um, <laughs> so you actually may have to tell people that they know what they're doing because they may not realize it, especially if they're underrepresented in your community. If they look at your community and they don't see anyone who looks like themselves in some way that is, is important to them, they, they may think they just like don't belong and have nothing to say. So you may have to remind them that actually they're the only ones on earth doing this really cool thing that they kind of forgot mattered. Um, but then when you actually review the proposals, make the review process blind, if at all possible. Because um, no one wants to feel like they're a token, right? No one wants to feel their proposal only got accepted because they're a woman or they're, they're black or whatever. Like, people hate that. Um, you want to accept the best proposals that you get. Um, and this, this, this is a great way to make people feel like the process is more fair, but it's also a great way to accept proposals you would not have otherwise accepted. Because it's really easy if you know the names of everyone to be like, oh yeah, that person, like they always talk, we know their work is good, um, and accept them instead of someone lesser known who may actually be doing cooler stuff. Um, so when... Uh, this uh, Courtney, whose last name I've totally forgotten, Stanton. Courtney Stanton uh, did this for a games conference. Um, she ended up with 50% women speakers not having any idea who the women were at the actual review stage, right? Um, it turned out, in fact, that her application pool was only 33% women. It's just that the women only submitted proposals if their talks were actually really good and they had a lot of terrible proposals from men that they rejected at the blind review stage. Um, <laughs> This, this uh, approach has been duplicated by uh, JSConf in, in Europe, um, and the Python Software Foundation does something similar for outreach for their speakers. Um, so th this is a thing that works if you're willing to, uh, to sink some time into it. All right, I have enough other things. I'm going to have to pick up some of the pace on them, I think. All right, uh, the Recurse Center, it used to be known as Hacker School. It's like a three-month programming residency in New York City um, that is, is really cool for a lot of reasons that I don't have time to get into. But one of the things it's known for is its social rules. Um, so it has four social rules that everyone is encouraged to follow and enforce. Um, in order to make their space more welcoming and, and in order to recognize that the people in their space are all working on things that are you know, new to them and that's exciting but also challenging and scary sometimes. Um, rule number one is no feigning surprise. So you know that thing where someone is like, oh wow, like I've, I've never worked in Ruby before and you're like, you've never worked in Ruby before, like who are you? <laughs> um, that happens a lot in, in tech. And it's actually really terrible because it, it makes people feel stupid. <laughs> um, none of us know everything there is to know in technology or in libraries because they're all way too big. Um, so, you know, it's, it's best if you don't act like that and just sort of take it as an opportunity to be like, hey, today you get to learn something cool. Um, no well actuallys, uh, by which they mean that thing where people are like, uh, yeah, so I was going down to the restaurant down the street, you know, the one that's yellow, and you're like, well, actually, it's, it's yellow green. You're like, really? Like, do I care about that hair splitting difference at this point? Um, if, again, if you have spent any time whatsoever in software, you, you have heard this happen all the time. And sometimes it's important to be that precise, but really most of the time you're, you're just irritating people and you're making them feel stupid. So don't do it. Um, 
no backseat driving. Um, I don't know if that idiom works in, in Germany, but, but the idea basically that, you know, if someone is driving the car and then a passenger in the back seat is, is being like, no, you turn right, oh, no, do that thing, that thing, that thing, like they're trying to control the whole process, but they're not the one driving. Um, people do that with uh, especially newbie programmers too, right? They, they don't let them just sit down and sort of figure out like how to do the thing. Not even programmers, like anytime new people are trying to learn a thing and experts are in the room, it's really tempting to tell them like everything and you should really shut up <laughs> because you will just stress them out and not give them a chance to, to work through it on their own and develop their own understanding. And then no subtle isms. Um, so things like sexism and racism um, and homophobia, like it's really easy to end up there, maybe even through jokes that you didn't even necessarily realize. Um, we're, we're digging on people from, from some background you may not share. Um, but those are all really, they're effective ways to exclude people from your space. Um, so at hacker school, they try to avoid that. And, they, and, and when they come up, you know, try to make sure that people understand like, why that might be off-putting um, or insulting to people. Um, and then another well-known strategy for uh, dealing with face-to-face -face events is uh, co conference codes of conduct, um, which are basically rules of the road. Um, if you have a conference, are there, are there things like sexual harassment that you think people should not do there? <laughs> if you think people should not do those things there, uh, write it down, you know, have some rules, um, and then have, have a system for dealing with it, right? If, if there is something that happens at your conference that is not acceptable conduct in your space, um, to whom can people report those events? Um, what is that group empowered to do? You know, can, can they, you know, kick people out? Can they tell people to stop it, you know? Um, but make sure you have it written down, um, both so everyone knows and the process has, has some legitimacy, and also so that if, you know, heaven forbid something does happen, you're not left trying to make it up as you go along. Because I've, I've seen conferences in the past that did not have codes of conduct, and then some kind of big harassment event happened at the conference, and the conference organizers are trying to figure out how to deal with it at the same time as they are dealing with it, and at the same time as all of Twitter is very unhappy with how they're dealing with it. And like, if, if you want to just have nightmares as a conference organizer, like this is how you have nightmares. Um, people never, ever deal with it well if they haven't thought of a, the process in advance, because it's too stressful. Um, so codes of conduct are, are rules that help you in an emergency and also help your attendees know that like someone will care if they complain about sexual harassment or something like that. Because um, they, they may not realize that people will care and so they may not feel comfortable looking for help. Um, but ideally they're also dialogues that let you have a conversation with your community as to what do you value culturally, what do you think is sort of your aspirations for who you want to be. Um, the best I've ever seen this done is Code for Lib, um, which you can check out their GitHub. Their, their code of conduct is on GitHub. People make pull requests, people have discussions in the issues queue. Um, and it really provides a way for people to talk about like who do we want to be, why do we want to have those values, how do we demonstrate that we are behaving in the way we want to behave, and, and how do we understand um, why things that may not seem relevant to us are in fact important to some people in our community. How do we account for that, how do we understand each other. Um, and then finally, in terms of governance, it's okay to have different rules for different spaces. Um, in particular, projects that are, are large enough may have a sort of beginner-friendly space and an expert space that may have very different sort of cultures and expectations. And that's okay, because these people have different needs, right? Um, Django has a Django users and a Django developers mailing list and, and the users list is for people who may be completely new to the project and may have very basic questions about like how do I do a thing 
And the developers list is, is for people who are you know, writing Django itself and making major architectural decisions. Um, and it's not okay to ask basic how do I do a thing questions on, on the dev list, and that's fine. It's fine to have different parts of your spaces, you know, your conference, your IRC channel, your mailing list or whatever. Have someone different rules. Um, just make sure they work for the people that you actually want to have in the space, which may not be the same as the people who are already in the space. Right? There may be people who aren't there yet because something about that space does not work well for them that you want to have included. So make sure to think about like, what rules are actually correct, um, which may, may be challenging, right? Because it may require change. And that gets us into the idea of culture. Um, if you have different rules for different spaces, if you have uh, values that drive how you act, those are all questions of culture, like who are we and how do we want to treat each other? The secret is everything is culture. Whether your project is inclusive or not, whether your project makes uh, wise decisions about governance or not, whether your project prioritizes things like writing documentation or not, this is all about culture. This is all about who you are as people and what your values are and, and what your habits are. And I can't really tell you how culture works, so I'm not gonna have sort of statements in this section, I'm gonna have questions. Uh, one question, particularly for a semantic web crowd, is how do you organize knowledge? We do a lot of that here. Um, all schemes of knowledge organization will end up over-representing some points of view and under-representing others. And what that means is that some people can see themselves or their work reflected in your knowledge organization, and some people can't. Uh, so I'm gonna give you an example from the Dewey Decimal System, which I understand is not uh, really used in Germany, but you can apply this to other knowledge representation systems uh, you may be familiar with. Um, so the basic idea of the Dewey System, if you don't uh, know it, is everything has a number that is like a three-digit number and then maybe a decimal and additional numbers. And so the 100s stand for one particular set of topics and the 200s are another set of topics and the 300s and, and so on and so forth. And, and that each of that is broken down hierarchically. Um, so the 300s are about uh, language and linguistics. And the first 20%, the 300s and the 310s, I guess, of, of the Dewey Decimal System are about general topics in linguistics. So all, all of your general topics, they get about that much of the space. Um, the next, I guess, 320s through 380s are European languages. So that's, that's great <laughs> for many of us here who are native speakers of something like English or German or maybe French or Spanish. Uh, there are lots of places in the Dewey Decimal System that they can represent books about those languages. Um, you, can, you can have extremely you know, detailed numbers that really represent very fine distinctions between different aspects of those languages because there's so much space in the categorization. And then literally the entire rest of the world gets the 390s. Uh, you know, Arabic, Japanese, Hindi, all of it has to get squished into this tiny um, so it's just not possible to represent sort of distinctions among different elements of, of languages and linguistics. Okay, um, I thought I had a little longer than that. All right, um, so this is an example, but there are lots of others which uh, Wakim has just told me I need to skip, but go read the Miriam Posner blog post that I linked to. Um, so like, can't, um, I think I will have to skip this one, but this comes down to read the Miriam Posner blog post. Okay, um, how does your culture allow for peripheral participation? Uh, there's this idea of legitimate peripheral participation, which is basically like uh, people's, people's participation in your community may not be that they're like core developers or, or conference organizers or something that's really hardcore. People's participation may be like they show up to one event or they, they make one like tiny little pull request to fix the grammar in your documentation. Um, how do you make that okay, right? Because that's okay. Not everyone is going to be a huge contributor. Um, and many people who will become huge contributors start out with little choices. So how do you make sure it's okay for people and, and easy for people to get involved in small ways? 
Um, how do you handle risk? When you have an open project, um, you're asking people to fail in public. You know, if people make a pull request on, on something like GitHub where everyone can see it, um, and they make a mistake, everyone can see it. And that's really scary. Um, how do you make it less scary? You know, if people make a mistake, are you like, wow, that was dumb? <laughs> or are you like, wow, yeah, I did that too. Like, the first time I tried to do that thing, that's, that's tricky. Let's see how we can fix it. Um, my friend uh, Somana Harishwa, uh, she was at the Recurse Center at one point. She was in one of their batches of programmers. And one of the things she said about that culture is, I can't tell you how freeing it felt the first week to say, I don't know a million times. Because I had been trained not to display ignorance for fear of being told I didn't belong. That's ubiquitous in technology communities. Um, and in both tech and libraries, we really value knowledge. So how, how do you make it okay for people to not know everything? And then the core question of culture is you walk into a space and you ask, you know, how might this look to someone else? Um, this is a gorgeous picture of exactly the sort of thing that I am a complete sucker for. I can look at these sort of rhythmic architectural pattern photos for like ever and did while making these slides. Um, but I could also look at this from a different angle and say this is completely inaccessible to people in wheelchairs, right? Um, this is hard to navigate if you have balance issues. Marble is slippery. Um, there's a ton of steps. If you can walk but you tire quickly for some reason, you're not going to be able to deal with this staircase. Um, parents of small children may be looking at the separation between those rails and how far it is to the bottom and sort of quietly having panic attacks right now. Um, the space can be simultaneously just gorgeous but also off-putting or impossible, depending on, on who you are and, and what you bring to it. Um, so the core question of how to make a community inclusive is when you look at a space, including and especially a space that is really welcoming to you, um, is ask yourself, how might this look to someone else and why? And then if the answer you come up with is, is wow, this looks like a space that, that I, I couldn't participate in under some set of, of constraints, you know, what, what can you do about that? How can you fix it? In conclusion, you know, originally I was gonna have like, I don't know, a thing about like the research about how diverse teams are smarter, which they are, and I was gonna have some really like insightful thing to wrap this all up in a bow, but then an awful lot of things happened over the past few weeks. Um, my country had this election that none of us actually understand right now. <laughs> um, <laughs> which, uh, you know, I'm, I'm looking at half the country hates the other half of the country and has no idea what they do all day and vice versa. And, and suddenly, inclusion seems pretty salient. You know, I, I, I'm sort of, I'm from the half of the country that voted for Trump and I live in the half of the country that would never dream of doing that. And, and so I'm sort of looking at people I value who think that the other ones are completely evil. And I, I kind of wish they knew more about each other <laughs> and maybe thought that we, we all live here together and should figure out how to do that without like being neo-fascists. Um, so that happened <laughs> and, and made inclusion seem really relevant. But honestly, I, I don't, find myself having really smart things to say about that one either because in fact what happened with me over the last few weeks is um, I, I gave Adrian and Wakim a heart attack a few weeks ago because <laughs> I emailed them and I said I might not be able to come to Germany uh, actually I'm, I might not be able to finish my talk at all and uh, and we should prepare for that because uh, my my daughter was in the hospital and uh, she was so sick that yeah, I didn't know what was really going to happen ever again, actually. Um, <laughs> anyway, she's fine now. She's right here. Yay. <laughs> um, but but I'm, I'm emailing the conference, and I'm, I'm saying these things like I'm, uh, like, I'm being a human being right now, and that is more important to me than getting any of my work done. Let's figure out how we deal with this, you know. Let's figure out what do we do if, 
if I can't come to Germany, uh, can I deliver the talk remotely? How are the logistics for that going to work? Um, <laughs> you guys should have a heads up of what if I can't do this at all? Like, you need to be able to prepare. Let's make stuff happen. And they were great about it. Thank you very much. Uh, if they had heart attacks, they didn't actually tell me. <laughs> and we came up with alternatives for, like, how could I do stuff remotely? Um, because people are actually bringing a lot of their lives to your projects or your spaces uh, that you may not know about. Like, I didn't mention any of this on Twitter. Um, and what choices can you make so that people can still be present and welcoming and get positive benefits out of being part of your community, um, even if things are going on in some way that, that make it really hard for them to do that. So what it, what it really comes down to is that inclusion is about how are we human beings together and how do we recognize that in each other and how do we make conscious choices that that make that all possible for us to be humans together. Thank you. Thank you very much, Antromeda. Uh, questions? Thank you very much. That was absolutely fantastic and just what I needed to hear this morning. Um, I have a question about how different levels of the community work together, particularly in the, in the role of educating new members of the community because I appreciated so much what you were saying about different levels of documentation and because I really value making communities open and accessible and providing inroads. Mm -hmm. And yet I also find sometimes that there is, man, I hope I can articulate this well, that there are issues where for any particular product or initiative, there's too much emphasis on well, we need to make it um, on, we need, there's too much emphasis on we need documentation for the newbies and not enough documentation for the higher level people, but also situations where I find that, man, members of the community who are not male and not white, etc., are the ones who get tasked with being the, the people who shepherd the newbies in. And I love, I love doing that, but I also know that not everyone who is like me loves doing that, right. and I hate it when other people are <laughs> tasked with that. So, so I'm sorry, that's a long question, but yeah. I wonder whether you have any thoughts on that. Yeah, I mean, I, th I think I've got sort of three things in my head. One is that in terms of documentation, right, it, it sounds like you're describing the, the world where people have written the tutorial but have not written the API reference or maybe the concept guide, and, and you need all three, right? You really do. Um, <laughs> And certainly the Django project is, is militant about requiring documentation for pull requests. And that can be part of your contributor guidelines, is like relevant documentation needs to get written before this can be accepted. Um, in terms of the other stuff, uh, there's, there's a paper I saw somewhere, and sadly I cannot remember the site, which basically says that um, you know, the, the people who are in the role of bringing new people into the community are basically always women who are socially, socially marginalized by the core contributors. Uh, so I've probably just described your life. You're welcome. Uh, that's, that's a thing. I don't know how to fix that. It is really annoying. I, I share your, your, um, your woes there. I think... I mean, I think a big part of it is... is if your culture claims to value bringing people in, then part of what it has to do there is explicitly value that, right? It's like in, in uh, US tenure requirements, you know, you have service as part of those requirements. Like, all right, like, if, if that's gonna be a thing you do, then recognize that that is a form of service and that people who are doing that, it, it takes time and that is time that you should understand when you are looking at the rest of their contributions, right? Um, 
find ways to, yeah, explicitly recognize that. And yeah, in terms of the other thing, um, I think it's important for everyone in the community to know, and if, if people are not rowing this, like yell at them, that, that just because like people are black does not mean they want to be on your diversity committee, right? It doesn't mean that they're necessarily experts in doing diversity outreach, and it definitely doesn't mean that they want to do it. Maybe they just want to write some code like everybody else, <laughs> right? Um, I actually, I, I staffed uh, Lida's first ever diversity committee over the summer, and I, I probably went through like 200 resumes because that outreach thing, it's high touch. Um, but one of the things I was looking for is like not just are you f maybe from some sort of community that's not well represented in Lida, but like do I see any evidence on your CV that you want to do this work? <laughs> Right? If you've not written about accessibility, if you've not been on a diversity committee or what, like I'm not gonna ask you to do it because that's not fair, right? You shouldn't have that extra burden. I don't know of a way to solve this problem, but I think yelling about it a lot is, is pretty important because people may not realize that, that they're placing these expectations on people and, and sometimes like, you know, you don't wanna do that work just because you happen to be in a marginalized group. <laughs> Other questions? So thank you very much again. Thank you.